Hello, this is Holly Sanders, and welcome to this presentation on the central nervous system. This presentation coincides with Chapter 7 from your Merib textbook, and it is specifically on the central nervous system. When we talk about the central nervous system, it's divided into the brain and the spinal cord, and we are going to start this presentation by discussing the four major regions of the brain. They are the cerebral hemispheres, the dyncephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. And here is the entire brain pictured with the spinal cord coming off the base of the brain. This is actually the brain stem here. Spinal cord coming off. The cerebellum is in the back. The dyncephalon would be this purple area and it is directly in the middle of the brain. Don't forget that the brain is, just like all anatomy, uh, three-dimensional. So you have to picture it with two sides and, and fully round instead of flat and all the rest of this belongs to the cerebrum or the cerebral hemispheres. And this is where we're going to start going through our four sections. When you think of the brain, or you've probably seen them before, the only thing you can see visibly is the cerebral hemispheres and maybe a bit of the, cere the cerebellum here in the backside. And when you look at the brain, you can see all of these ridges and grooves all throughout it. And these do have anatomical names. The ridges, which my cursor is on right now, are called the gyri, and that's G-Y-R-I, gyri. And the grooves that I'm touching right here, where it sinks down, are called the sulci. That's S-U-L-C-I. So the sulci sink, and the ridges are called the gyri. And then there's divisions within the brain of other grooves, and I'm touching one right here. And these are called fissures. And let me move to the next slide. Here's a better picture of it. These are fissures, and they actually divide the four lobes of the cerebrum. And here you can see, anteriorly, there's the frontal lobe, then the parietal. On the posterior part of the brain is the occipital lobe, and then on the side are the temporal lobes. Now remember, the brain has two halves, and we're looking at a sagittal or sideways view right now, so we're only seeing one half of the brain. In fact, because this is the anterior side and this is the posterior side, we would be looking at the left cerebral hemisphere. So there would also be a right frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. And here I have listed the basic physiology of these lobes. The frontal lobe has to do with movement and personality. And also the frontal lobe houses a really important area called Broca's area. And this is where speech is developed. And many of you are going into the EMT fields and will be dealing with people who have strokes. And many of you um, already know that a lot of the warning signs of a stroke is slurred speech or inability to speak. And when this happens, you'll know that there is probably some sort of blood loss or blockage going to the frontal lobe because that's what a stroke is, is when blood isn't able to get to the nervous tissue of the brain. Next, in the parietal lobe, its major function is sensory. And in this, we're talking about the sense of feel. To the back, the occipital lobe is dealing with vision or the sense of vision and the temporal lobe has to do with hearing or auditory sense. Here's another sagittal view of the cerebrum. Again, here's the frontal lobe and the red part is also part of the frontal and you'll see here there's something called the central sulcus. Remember a sulci are the grooves within a brain and as well the fissures are a groove. So here this would be a fissure dividing the parietal and the frontal lobe, but because it is the fissure between these two and it's in the middle, it is referred to as the central sulcus, following this line down. So if you were to divide the brain through the central sulcus, you would be doing a frontal division. Here in the frontal lobe is the area that I was just speaking about called Broca's area. It's where speech is. And I know this picture may look a little odd at first, but let me give you some orientation. Start up here in the upper left corner and you'll see it's highlighting where the central sulcus is, where the frontal lobe, which is in red, meets the parietal lobe, which is in blue. So here's the frontal lobe, and here again, 
you can see the gyri or ridges going to the sulci where it sinks along the cerebrum of the frontal lobe and then the white area here in the middle would be the central sulcus and then here we start on the parietal lobe, this is the gyri, the ridges, and the sulci going all the way through. To give you an example of how this works, let's say that you aren't looking but you're reaching over to grab a glass of water, of ice water. So your hand is going to find the ice water and you're going to feel that that you know, is your cold ice water that you're looking for because that feeling is going to be sent from nervous cell to nervous cell, basically neuron to neuron, all the way to this section of the parietal lobe where you're going to interpret that information and realize that you're touching what you're reaching for. But then if you want to lift your arm to bring the glass to your face, then that message needs to be sent from the parietal lobe over to the area on the frontal lobe, which is going to send a message back down your nervous system to your bicep and the other muscles that's going to let you lift the glass through elbow flexion. So this is the same for any feeling versus movement. The feeling would come into the brain to the proper section of the parietal lobe, and then if movement is associated, that nervous transmission would be sent through the central sulcus over to the frontal lobe, where a movement impulse will be sent out through the nerve cells until it reaches the muscle and causes a contraction, just like we learned in the last unit. It's going to go through an action potential and the muscle will contract. So when I was explaining in the muscle unit, there must be a nervous system stimulus. The frontal lobe is where that stimulus comes from. So imagine if you feel an itch on your nose and you can't scratch it, such as if you were in surgery, um, working in the, oper in the operating room, you can't touch your face, but you can feel the itch, but you don't have to send the signal over to your arm to move it. This is the difference between sensing something and then sending a transmission over to the other side where movement occurs. Here is another sagittal view of the brain. In this view, you can see all the anatomy we've talked about thus far. Here is the cerebrum. This would be the right cerebral half because we're looking at the sagittal view this is the anterior portion and the posterior portion and you can always find the posterior portion by the cerebellum here on the bottom so this would be the occipital lobe the parietal lobe frontal lobe and in here would be the temporal lobe you wouldn't be able to see it on this one because it would be on the outside or lateral side and what holds the two hemispheres of the cerebrum together is this section that I'm highlighting right here called the corpus callosum and it is made of what is called white matter and you've probably heard that the brain is made of gray matter and white matter and the basic difference is that gray matter is the outer layer so it would be on the outside or what we call the cortex of the cerebrum and the white matter would come from the corpus callosum and it really deals with the conductivity of messages from the brain. And it's also called white matter because it's lined with myelin sheaths. And you may remember that myelin from uh, medical terminology means white. And the myelin sheaths help conduct the, the signals or the transmission sent out from the brain. Now we're going to look at the very middle section that I'm putting my cursor around right now called the dyncephalon. And you can see the term up here at the top of the page. The dyncephalon is broken down into three main parts, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and then the epithalamus. And for those of you that are comfortable in med term, you've probably already realized that the hypothalamus would be below the thalamus and the epithalamus would be above the thalamus. So let's first look at the functions of the thalamus. But basically, the thalamus is the relay station for sensory impulses. So you can see that when the spinal cord comes up, there will be information that's coming from your peripheral nervous system or the nerves that are all through your body that's going to send sensory information towards your brain. When it gets into the brain, it's going to go into the dyncephalon, specifically the thalamus. The thalamus is then going to act as sort of a mail sorter and determine where this information needs to be sent to the parietal lobe. So to take an example, let's say that you touch something with your hand. Just whatever's close by, pick it up. 
when you feel that with your fingers, there is a sensory impulse being sent toward your brain. This pathway is called the efferent pathway. When it comes from your arm, through your shoulder, up the cervical spinal nerves to the spinal cord, then finally up to the thalamus, the thalamus is going to sort it to the proper place on the parietal lobe. So the thalamus would sort it here on the parietal lobe. This is the illustration we looked at before. So if you want to then move your hand and do something with the object you just picked up, the parietal lobe is going to send that information across the central sulcus to the frontal lobe where the frontal lobe will then send the message back to the muscles of your arm and your hands so movement can occur. So again, the thalamus is the relay station for the sensory impulses. Below the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Again, this is inside the dinencephalon. The hypothalamus is extremely important for maintaining our homeostasis because it's in charge of regulating our body temperature, which we discussed back in the first chapter. Uh, we can't get too hot or too cold to sustain life. It controls our water balance as well as regulates our metabolism. So a lot of our maintenance activities are, are held within our hypothalamus. And when it comes to things like water balance and metabolism, one of the ways this is um, homeostatically controlled is through our hormones and hormones that the brain releases. The main gland that's releasing these hormones is called the pituitary gland. We'll discuss this more in the endocrine system, but if you look at this diagram, it is flipped from the ones we've looked at before. Now we're looking at the anterior side to the right and the posterior side to the left. Here is the corpus callosum, the dinencephalon in between, and here in the green area is the hypothalamus. And if you look, you can see this little extension hanging off the hypothalamus, and that is the pituitary gland. And again, we'll discuss this in more length, but it's going to release hormones that help regulate metabolism and our water balance. And that happens basically by telling the kidneys how much water to hold on to or release to make our water balance correct. Finally, the third part of the dinencephalon is the top part called the epithalamus. And its main function is that it controls our circadian rhythms. And for those of you that aren't familiar with this term, that basically means our sleep and wake cycles. And you've all experienced this. When you'll be sitting up at night, for some of it is 9 o'clock. For others, the night owl is out there. It might be 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. But suddenly you'll feel the tiredness come over you. And that is another hormone that's released from something called the pineal it says pineal body, but really a pineal gland. As you can see, it's listed right here. And the pineal gland will release a hormone called melatonin, which you've probably heard of because people buy that over the counter to help increase the ability to sleep. But our body manufactures it naturally, and it's released from the epithalamus. Another area of the epithalamus is called the choroid plexus. And this is where cerebrospinal fluid is manufactured. We're going to discuss this in more length here in just a minute. Just wanted to point out um, that the choroid plexus is inside the epithalamus. And lastly, all throughout the dinencephalon is something called the limbic system. And basically, the limbic system is our emotional brain. And just to go over a, a few components of it, some of you may have heard about some of this if you've taken psychology. But it contains something called the mammillary bodies, here. And they are impaired by alcohol intoxication and be can become damaged by alcohol abuse. Another area of the limbic system is the hippocampus. And this has a great deal to do with our memory. And it's also the area that's damaged if someone uh, has Alzheimer's disease. Another really interesting area of our limbic system is called the amygdala. And this is the area for extreme emotions such as sex or anger. So far we've covered the cerebrum and its four components, its four main lobes, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Then we went through the dinencephalon and looked at the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And now we're ready to go to the third main part of the brain, which is the brain stem. And here it is in green. 
and it's going to have three components, the midbrain, which is up here, the pons just beneath it where the little bubble comes out, and then the medulla oblongata beneath that. And then below the medulla is where the spinal cord comes out. So really the brainstem is the superior portion of the spinal cord where it communicates with the brain. Now as far as functionality, the midbrain is in charge of other sensory reflexes. So if you recall, the thalamus is the mail sorter for our senses, our sense of feel, and it sends information to the proper part of the parietal lobe. Midbrain does this for vision and hearing. So if sensory information comes in through the eyes, it's going to go to the midbrain, which is going to send it to the proper area in the occipital lobe. Or if it's hearing, it's going to come in through the ears, go to the midbrain, and then it's going to be sent to the proper area of the temporal lobe. The major job of the pons is to regulate our breathing. Just go ahead and memorize that. Pons has to do with breathing. Look at the jobs of the medulla oblongata. Also, heart rates, blood pressure. It helps with breathing, but again, pons is the main source for this and then swallowing and vomiting. The last region of the brain is the cerebellum, and the basic roles of the cerebellum are balance and equilibrium. Now there's a part of our inner ear that we're going to discuss in the next chapter that will send a message as to where we are if, as far as if our head's tilted or if we spin around or any sort of information when it comes to balance and equilibrium and that's going to be interpreted within the cerebellum. So there you are. You've got now reviewed the four major regions of the brain, the cerebrum and its four lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal, which you can't see because it's on the outside or lateral view. And here you can see the fissures dividing these lobes. Remember that the fissure between the frontal and the parietal lobe is called the central sulcus. Then you have your corpus callosum, which is going to attach the two cerebral hemispheres. In the very middle of the brain, you have the dyencephalon, and here is the pituitary glands, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and the epithalamus above it. On the very back, you have the cerebellum, controls balance and equilibrium. And then coming off the brain, you have the brain stem with the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. And here it shows the spinal cord coming below the